chapter 6, verse 1 to 8 this morning. Let's read responsively Isaiah chapter 8. I'm sorry, chapter 6, verses 1 to 8. I am reading from the English Standard Version, and the uh, uh, verses are on the screen for you. So well, let's read responsively in honor and love of God's Word. Chapter 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. Amen. This is the word of God. I'd like to share with you a, a, you know, a story, my experience, back when I was in college. I had visited the Gulf Shores in, down in Gulf of Mexico for the first time over spring break. That's what they do down there. They go to the Gulf Shores, to Pensacola City. Anybody been to Pensacola, Florida? Oh, good, I can tell you all about it. <laughs> well, I have seen many beaches in my life up to that point, right? I've seen the uh, East Sea in Korea, you know, that uh, it's on, on the other side of uh, Japan, and uh, how the, you know, the, the uh, strong waves and, and cold waters are, the blue, you know, deep sea, I've experienced and seen that. I've, I've also seen the, uh, the waves and the uh, soft sand of uh, Los Angeles, Southern California, and experienced, you know, the water there. It's really cold there as well. But I've never seen sand that was like sugar white. So white, so pure. I mean, you have to be there to believe me. You say, Pastor Joseph, no, salt, sand cannot be white. It's like yellowish, you know, brownish color. Okay, is there a picture? Yeah. <laughs> it's just a picture, but it doesn't do justice, but just help your imagination. You know, it was just so wide, and the, the weather was hot with the sun just scorching, but, and the, the water temperature was like, exaggerate a little bit, you know, bath water, like lukewarm, enjoying the, uh, the ocean there, and uh, enjoying the whole day, in fact, in the sun. Uh, I hadn't had that experience, like, forever. Never been to Hawaii or the Caribbeans, but I don't think it would be better than this. And I just had a wonderful, Truly an awesome time. And after some stay, after a couple of days of stay on the Gulf Shores, we went down to Orlando and, you know, where the theme parks are. And uh, because I had, you know, I, I grew up in Korea and high school and middle school and all that. And for the first time, I really enjoyed myself as a young adult and had the best time of my life. It was truly an awesome experience, a time of relaxing, a time of... Um, comforting, I believe, from God. And sometimes, from time to time, I still have those memories, those moments of, of comfort and of pleasure and of rest. But I know if I go back there today, it's, it won't be the same. Because the true thing we're always after is not really comfort, right? It's, it's more than just a vacation somewhere. <clears throat> we're surely seeking peace in our life. A peace that is worry-free kind of peace. A peace that uh, you are not, knowing that you're not judged by anyone, that you are truly accepted and you are truly satisfied. We aspire, we admire a state like that, a true shalom peace state in our lives. And we think, oh, that's just a dream. That will maybe happen in heaven. But did you know, when God created us, He intended us to enjoy the peace heavenly satisfaction and 
contentment when he created us. We have lived in a sinful world, the broken down world for such a long time, humanity has, all of us have, that we forgot what it was like to be in the paradise, in the presence of God. But as we look back in scripture, we're reminded that God is the person who is the only one that can give us this true satisfaction, maybe happiness, if you will, that we so desire every day, in fact. There's a biblical word that describes this aspect of God that satisfies us, and it's the word holiness. Holiness. What is this holiness? What is the holiness that is so foreign to us that we don't ever use it during the week? What is this holiness that God is trying to show us and telling us that what, 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 how can we receive this holiness if it is so great? As we continue on the Gospel Project series, namely the, king, the Prophet and Kings, we've been looking at different prophets, different kings, and these kings and prophets have been revealing to us who God is. What kind of God is speaking to us and how he loves us. And we look at today of the southern prophet, southern kingdom, southern um, Judah king, kingdom's prophet, his name was Isaiah. Through Isaiah, we, have a, we see a glimpse. Through his eyes, we see what the holiness of God is and what that could mean for us. What is the holiness of God? And my message, this passage is broken up into three. It defines for us what holiness is. Is. The first one is this. Holiness is godliness. Can we say it together? together? Uh, holiness is godliness. Holiness is godliness. Right. Holiness is godliness. Holiness is something that is like, uh, something that is like God, that is from God. That's what it's saying, basically. We look at the context and verse 1 tells us that this was a time when a king died. Who's, which king was this? In the year that king Uzziah died. You must understand that Isaiah was writing this phrase with much sadness and grief. Because when people heard the name Uzziah and death, it gave them tremendous despair. Because they had not known a king um, before Solomon, anyone like Uzziah. Uzziah was the most awesome king they had after a long period between Solomon and Uzziah. Because he had strengthened the national security, he strengthened the military, he also strengthened the um, infrastructure of the country, he built many towers and cities, and he built a lot of stuff. He was respected by the countrymen. And uh, he was also influential, not only in his country, but also internationally, so the other nations feared him and revered him and respected him. So Judah was respected by others. And when this King Uzziah passed away, you can imagine the grief, the shadow of grief that was cast over the entire nation of Judah. And especially because Isaiah was of royal blood. He probably spent a lot of time next to the throne of the king. And maybe was a cousin, a distant relative, we don't, we're not sure, and seeing one of his family members pass away, such a, a good king pass away. It was, it darkened the, the soul of Isaiah and he was saddened. But at this most desperate time, this time of despair and distress, is when God showed up and showed him something very special. He says, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Isaiah saw the throne of God. He had seen many thrones in his life, probably, of kings and principalities, but this was the real thing. It was lifted high up. It was exalted. And it, there was on the throne, not a dead king like Uzziah, but the undying king was on the throne. And when Isaiah realized this, he was so excited. That's just the understatement, right? And where were they? He, he was uh, in this throne room, and not only a throne, but he was in the temple, the heavenly temple of God. Wow, he had been in the temple every day to worship God as a prophet in Judah. But 
he sees this vision and he is actually in the temple in heaven. The temple that Moses himself saw, that he made replica of on this earth. He was in the original temple of God and, and what amazement and wonder there must have been in Isaiah's heart as he pondered upon the glory of the one sitting on the throne. And indeed, it says the glory of his train of robe was uh, all over, felt, felt all over the temple, and it was even felt on the earth. You know, uh, I remember when I first visited um, Paris a long time ago and went on the Eiffel Tower. You've been to Eiffel Tower? See, you haven't been to the Gulf Shore, but... <laughs> I know you have. I know some of you have. <laughs> and uh, you know, before then, uh, you know, I used to see Eiffel Tower on like like uh, crackers, you know, packages like sables. <laughs> Maybe you're if you grew up in Korea, you know what I mean. And uh, you know, I saw pictures and images and you know little models of it. But when I was actually there, you know, and uh, riding the elevator up for second and third level and taking all these you know pictures. Uh, you know, from the ground up and, you know, and having all this fun. It was, it was great to see the real thing. It were, there was a, spe a special emotion. It was moving, in fact. It was uh, sensational. I had a wonderful time. If one can be so joyful about a man-made power and structure, how would it be when we actually get inside the throne of God, in, inside the temple of God, and feel the presence of God? You know, there's a hymn uh, by the old hymn writer that goes, Jesus, the very thought of thee with sweetness fills my heart, but sweeter far thy face to see and in thy presence rest. We always think about, we pray to our Jesus, but how much sweeter and so how much greater when we actually see our Lord Jesus face to face. That Jesus that you pray in his name every day you see his face and you're in his presence how awesome would that be for isaiah this experience was probably like that it was an experience of a lifetime something that satisfied him more than he could ever imagine ever in his life he was in the presence of his lord and we see the vision expanded now the focus is the objects around the throne of God. And we see in verse 2, there are these things called seraphs. I should say things, these beings called seraphs. And these seraphs are messengers of God. The word seraph means uh, the, you know, burning ones, the flaming ones. So you can imagine there are uh, illuminated, uh, bright beings, uh, heavenly celestial beings around God. And they had six wings, right? two covering their face and two covering their feet and with two flying. Wow, these angels, these seraphs who are sinless, even they are before God and they have to cover their face and cover their feet before the awesomeness of God. And how do we describe this entire scene? Are there any human words to describe this awesome, fearful scene in the throne room of God? And in verse, uh, the next verse, actually verse uh, 3, the seraphs, these angels, describe this scene for us in three words. They say, holy, holy, holy. This is holy. Holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. As uh, you probably heard you know, many times, and if you've learned, listened to sermons for your lifetime, you know that when in Hebrew literature something is written the same time three times, what does it mean? First time it means, okay, holy. Second time it's, oh, more holy. Third time it's like the most. So it's like the verb and the you know, comparative and the superlative, right? This is the absolute form of holiness. God, you are the most holiest. There is none like you, kind of thing. We hear the sounds of these angels worshiping God day and night, you know, saying, holy, holy, holy. This word holy literally means the separated one. The angels of seraphs are saying, God, you are unique. You are different from all the creation, any creation that we see on this earth. You are truly the most holiest being 
in the entire universe. He is the absolute separate being, unique, one of a kind. And you are awesome. And the whole earth is filled with his glory, and the whole earth even recognizes that they know this. They feel his holiness. The angels are trying to describe what they're going through right now with, the, uh, with words that we can understand. And Isaiah is writing this for us. And uh, so the creation feels God's holiness. And uh, it says, the foundation of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. The angels are singing, and the foundation was like earthquakes shaking. And the house was filled with smoke. It was as if the holiness of God is felt in the very bodies and physical, you know, pres in physical being of Isaiah and even all the earth. I remember, uh, you know, when I was, I attended this youth conference called JAMA, uh, and uh, many of you probably know what this is. And uh, this was a gathering of about like 5,000 kids in one big conference, hotel conference room. Do you know what it feels like to have 5,000 youth kids in a crammed conference room, dark, you know, all lights are out and stuffy. <laughs> That's awesome, in fact, you know. Uh, this was in Dallas, and uh, remember, I think it was David Crowder Band and Chris Tom was there. All these awesome guys were there leading the praise. And do you see, have a picture? Just for your imagination, this is not the real thing, of course not. And uh, the praise leader, you know, not as good looking as James here, but uh, was singing and praising the Lord, and suddenly, starts to jump, right? Do you jump too sometimes? When you're excited, the Holy Spirit. <laughs> starts to jump. And guess what? All 5,000 kids started to jump. And this was on the second floor. This conference room was the second floor of hotel room. And I thought it was an earthquake, really. The whole floor was like <laughs> bending. I was afraid we'd be on the evening news. You know, the whole thing collapses and... You know, we meet our Lord Jesus. But, uh, you know, um, it was just an amazing sight. Not just the music and sound, but the excitement, the kids worshiping the Lord, 5,000 together in one voice, praising, holy is our God. It was an awesome sight. And, and imagine, if just youth kids can praise like this, the heavenly celestial beings with all their strength and might, praising our Lord, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And it was shaking the very threshold of the temple, the heavenly temple of God. It was truly an awesome and amazing sight. In a world there's, where there's little hope today, and uh, where there's so much despair and death, like the death of Uzziah, or maybe the death of something that you are holding on to. One thing that gives us a glimpse of hope well, a glimpse of hope that, um, that Isaiah held on to was the presence of God, was the holiness of God. What was it about this scene that made it so special and so satisfying for Isaiah, comforted Isaiah? Was it the loud singing noises, the music? Was it the, the lights and the visuals, you know, of the seraphim, the, the flaming ones? Maybe they all contributed. But... I think, you know, they didn't have the technology back then, but maybe we can produce something similar with our technology, right? Again, in a dark room and lights and, and smoke, smoke machine and all the heavy sounds and, and bass and all that. But we know that this scene was not about that, right? Because if it really was about that, it would really be a performance. That was not what Isaiah was impressed with. Isaiah was impressed with, again, going to the concept that I'm talking about this morning, the holiness of God. The holiness of God itself was something that really comforted, that gave Isaiah the satisfaction, the contentment that he was so searching for his entire life. What is this holiness of God? Yes, I've uh, said earlier that in the original meaning, it means being separated, totally different from everything else. But if you go to a deeper level, it means that holiness is absolute, impeccable uh, ethical character, in fact, a clean ethical character. It also can mean absolute righteousness. This holy God always makes the right decision in every circumstance, in any situation. It means he's also perfectly all true. 
He only proclaims truth. He's true all the time. In other words, what is holiness? In a nutshell, as we talked about earlier, it is godliness. Holiness is something that is like God. Only God possesses this absolute, clean, ethical, righteous, and truthfulness that the world has never seen. If there was somebody on this earth that, would, that has like a hundred, one millionth of this, this holiness of God, we would all be bowing down to that person in respect and in honor. Why is the Lord, why is Isaiah showing this passage to us, what he experienced as a vision? I believe it is not just as a show or performance, uh, as something that has happened and just, you know, for entertainment, for your pleasure, listening pleasure. I believe it is for us to long for this holiness of God. But it's just to let us long for the holiness of God. Not the things that we always see, the things that can meet our temporary needs. But God is showing us that there is something more eternal that is truly satisfying, and it is the holiness of God. When we are worshiping before our holy God, we find answers to our life, most difficult problems, and, uh, uh, and all these situations. Because when we hear that God is the absolute good in our life, when we understand that God is the one who makes right the wrong, He is the one who can uh, bring good and evil, this truly is a consolation to us. This truly gives us hope like none other. And when we truly worship this holy God, it kind of rubs off on us too. We can become holy and beautiful like Him. Especially if you are one of those people who have been persecuted and you're hungry for righteousness. Especially if you are one of those people who have been oppressed, you have been sick, you have been mistreated. And when you hear that God is true, God is righteous and just, and He is ethically 100% pure, there is no sin with Him, we are glad. And we, uh, we find all the answers of our lives in Him, in our God. Maybe David, King David, before he was king, he understood this fact. He knew the joy of being before this holy God. That's why he writes this prayer. He uh, writes it for us, for us to know what he was praying to his Lord. And uh, can we read together, actually, it's Psalm 27, verse 4. I believe uh, we can find it on the screen together. So let's read it in one voice, this prayer of David. Ready, go. One thing have I asked of the Lord that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. When David was unjustly you know, he was persecuted by Saul. He was chased like a dog by the entire, all the army, the military of the country. He desired one thing. God, I want to be in your presence, to gaze upon your beauty, and to just be in your temple. I want you to imagine yourself being at church during the week. Oh, it's unimaginable. <laughs> during the week, you're sitting here, nobody's here in the quiet chapel and the screen is up, there's the cross. I wish we could see the cross more, right? There's a cross on the back, uh, back of me, and uh, you're just there and talking to God. And as you pray to God, you, you remember how He has forgiven you, how Jesus has died for your sins. And you can tell Him anything and everything about your suffering, your difficulties, and He reminds you what a a beautiful God He is, and how He understands you, and He touches you, and how He He heals. And you also remember remember that He died, and He resurrected, and He overcame death. So you can lay all your burdens at the feet of this Jesus, as you realize you're before the Holy God. You, for some reason, want to stay there longer. You, also, for some reason, want to just be in His presence. That's what David experienced every day. He wanted to be closer to his God because he longed for the holiness of God. He longed for the presence of God. Brothers and sisters, 
I encourage all of us to let us long for this holiness of God that is offered to us, just as it was offered to Isaiah. What is holiness? Holiness is godliness, and God offers it to us. What is holiness? Secondly, holiness is a mirror to our sinfulness. Uh, can we say this together as well? Holiness is a mirror to our sinfulness. As Isaiah was comforted to hear and to see that God is holy in an in unjust uh, time and where it was, uh, you know, there was no hope after the death of Uzziah, he suddenly realized something. He was scared to death. And it wasn't just uh, you know, uh, you know, a terror movie or something that, you know, a scary thought that caught him, but it was a terror that came from inside out. It was real from his utmost being. He was scared. When he realized how beautiful and how holy God was, God is, but how unholy, how sinful, how uh, under the standard he was before God. And so we find in verse 5, he reacts in the most agonizing, agonizing, agonizing way. He says, Where is me, for I am lost? Another translation is, says, Where is me, for I am doomed? Where is me, for I am undone? Where is me, for I am ruined? You see, you know, he wasn't saying, God, forgive me for my sins. I'm dirty and I'm filthy and all that. He just can't say anything before God. He just saying, I'm just dead. I'm done. Oh, my God. You are so holy. I'm just so unfit. He's not asking God for forgiveness. He can't. He's just so overwhelmed by the presence of God, the holiness of God. And look at what specifically he's noticing about himself that is, uh, unholy. It says, I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. What's this about lips being unclean? Why just the lips? Why not everything else? Well, lips is the channel that expresses your life. You know, you know whatever is in your heart, someday, sometime, it'll come through your mouth, come out through your mouth. And he sees his mouth is filthy with sin which means that his heart is also corrupt. And he also sees around him, God, I also live among unclean lip people, unclean heart people. We're all unclean. I'm undone. I'm ruined. That was the, the reality that Isaiah found himself in. But right at that moment, in verse 7, we see that one of the seraphs of God coming to Isaiah with a burning coal right from the, throne of, from the altar of God. He grabs it with a, with a tongue and puts it on his lips and says, you are cleansed. You are clean. You see, when God shows us his glory, it's not to judge us. It's not to punish us. It is to cleanse us. And Isaiah quickly realized this. The only way we know that we are a sinner is when we see ourselves against the mirror of God's holiness. Holiness is a mirror to our sinfulness. No matter how righteous, self-righteous life you, know, you might have lived, or you know, respected, a person is respected in society and everybody looks up to them, when they reflect themselves on the holiness of God, they cannot but confess the same as Isaiah saying, Woe is me, for I am ruined. I am undone. I am so unclean. I am so filthy. When our standard is the world, the law of this land, you know, traffic laws, we don't feel, you know, unclean. But when we are reflecting ourselves before the holy God, the holiest God, holy, holy, holy God, we truly are undone. So for those who are seeing themselves in that way, they realize that they are ruined. When God brings that good news, the gospel, it truly becomes the good news for them. That's why Jesus says in Luke chapter 19, 10, so let's read this verse together, very short verse. What did Jesus say about this? 
uh, ready, go. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. One more time. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. For those who see themselves as lost. I am ruined. I am unholy. I am filthy. The Son of Man came to seek and save. Uh, you know, a long time ago, I heard from my dad. You know, he's also a pastor, and he goes around, talk, does a lot of speaking engagements. And he told me about this church he visited. And at this church, he heard this story. He says, um, there was a uh, sister at the church, uh, and uh, she was a devout Christian, and she prayed a lot for her husband, who was a professor at a university. Does that story sound familiar to a lot of us? <laughs> you know, usually wives are, the women are more righteous and pious uh, before the Lord. So she's been praying so, so much for her husband to become saved so they can go to heaven together. But he was, you know, stubborn and resistant. But with uh, so many words and persuasions and, um, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, um, carrots, I guess, uh, brought him to church. Very, you know, uh, made every effort to bring him to church that Sunday. And in her heart, if you were the wife, what would you think? Oh, I wish the pastor would really speak richly and heavily on the gospel so my husband will believe and trust Jesus today, right? So she was praying. But uh, as things go, uh, the pastor was speaking on the book of Revelation. <laughs> Very difficult, even for mature Christians. And she, she, she was, uh, you know, she had her head down and and she was sad. You know, my husband needs to hear the gospel. Why is he preaching on Revelation today? That's not the topic you should talk, teach on. But anyway, um, the whole you know, worship service was over. But the pastor noticed one thing as he was preaching. He noticed that the gentleman was in tears all throughout the sermon. And so after the service was over, he, he went over to the gentleman, and the pastor did, and said hello and you know, introduced himself. And asked him, so you cried so much, can I ask, you know, how, you, how are you? And uh, this is what the gentleman said. He said, Pastor, I haven't been to church. I don't know God. I don't know the Bible. I don't really understand everything that you said. But I did notice that the world that you're talking about, you're speaking about, is a world of light. A world of goodness and life. And my world, my heart is filled with bitterness and darkness and hate and I don't know pastor just tears flowed throughout the service because of this contrast brothers and sisters whether you are been a Christian all your life or you just come to church for the first time when we encounter the holiness of God how different he is from anything everything we know of on this earth how good he is how true He is, how righteous He is, in fact, how holy He is, as we encounter His holiness. We cannot but recognize the sinfulness of our heart. Yes, God forgave and cleansed Isaiah through the burning coal, but God cleansed us not with a temporary coal one time, but He cleansed us with the pure, precious blood of Jesus Christ. Once for all, all our sins have been forgiven. Eternally, perfect forgiveness is given to us. And we realize that God has already given this grace to us, and we realize that even that, we have been rejecting, we have been refusing to believe in Jesus Christ, and we are sinning doubly before God, before the Holy God, and now We've rejected the gospel and we've been sinning even more. As we see the experience and see the holiness of God, this becomes a mirror to our sinfulness. Holiness is a mirror to our sinfulness. But grace comes through our Lord Jesus Christ. There's a third meaning to holiness. Holiness is God's invitation to godliness. Let's say this last one together as well. Holiness, Holiness. is God's invitation, God's invitation to godliness. God's. Verse 8, we see Isaiah. He's cleansed. He's forgiven before the Lord. And at this moment, God asks him this question. 
whom shall I send and who will go for us? Come think of, imagine yourself like Isaiah, you know, you're the only audience there before God. And God is saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Hint, hint. <laughs> you know, when I was at the other church, you know, before I came, Cornerstone, you know, it was a big church. And uh, so the senior pastor would sit, you know, there and then he would have this intern pastor, you know, assisting him during the service. And one time the senior pastor said to his intern pastor, hey, hey, Mr. So-and-so, don't you think it's kind of warm here in the sanctuary? And he's kind of new and he doesn't know what says. So yeah, I think it's very warm. It just sits there. <laughs> And he got in trouble later because, you know, hint, hint, go turn the AC on. Um, anyway, God wanted to send Isaiah out. Once Isaiah experienced the holiness of God, God wanted to give him the mission. He was commissioned to spread this holiness to the people who are hard-hearted. This was to be a very difficult message. We haven't read these verses yet, but we know in a nutshell that, you know, these people will not listen to your word. These people will not want to see the Lord as you've seen it. But despite, you still, still need to preach. You still need to proclaim the holiness to these people. Why? Because it was God's way of proclaiming repentance. He was wanting them to repent. There will be so few people listening to you, Isaiah. The last verse, verse 13 of the chapter, says that there will be the few holy seed, the people who are remaining holy, few holy seeds who will listen to you and be saved. They will also experience this holiness of God. Once we experience the holiness of God, once we are touched by Him, we are commissioned to share this holiness with the people around us. Yes, we also need to work on our holiness to become like God, godliness. We need to emulate that character of God. But we also need to share with the world, the world what, his, what this holy God is, his uh, pure uh, God, that is, that is a true God, that he is truly a righteous God and he's a good God. And uh, the New Testament author of Peter, you know, Peter, Jesus' disciple, makes this very clear and very direct for us that we need to be the messengers of God's holiness. Uh, read with me 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, this amazing verse together. Let's read. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellency of him who called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. You are to be like a billboard sign on the highway to proclaim the excellence of God, the beauty of God, the glory of God, the holiness of God. And that's why you and I are called holy nation. Royal priest, chosen ones by God. And yet this time God is nudging you. Hint, hint. Who shall I send? Who will go for us? Holiness is God's invitation to holiness. As I wrap up this message, uh, I just want to make it clear one more time. Pastor Joseph, you talked about holiness this morning, but I still don't get it. What is holiness? These, these concepts, right? ethics and you know perfection and truth and goodness but can't really grab it right well i want to put it into one nutshell you can say this what is holiness holiness is jesus christ amen can we say this one last time holiness is jesus christ, is jesus christ? because john the disciple of jesus in chapter one talks about this jesus he describes him. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we've seen His glory, glory as the only Son of God from the Father. And when we gazed upon Him, He was full of grace and glory. This Son, this Jesus, was nothing like any, anybody we had ever seen upon this earth. We have never experienced full, the full glory and honor of God, holiness of God, yet the mercy and love was also in Him. What does it mean to become holy? 
for ourselves. It means to become more like Jesus Christ. And you knew that was coming, right? To become more like Him. Uh, these past weeks, we've been really praying that we would have our quiet time with our God. I want to encourage you to have your quiet time, not just quiet time, but a holy time with God each morning. As Jesus speaks His Word, it rubs on your heart. And as, as the holiness is lived out through your lives, not only with your mouth, but with your life, you will be able to show the holiness of God through your life. That's what it means to proclaim His glory among the nations. And indeed, we are living on the nations in Silicon Valley, right? I pray that all of us would desire to, to have the holiness of God. And as we read, as we obey the holy words of our Lord Jesus, that this holiness would not just be a concept in our heads, in our heart, but it would be a lifestyle, a, something that we say, something that we do each day. And people will see Wow, that brother, that sister is so different. I haven't seen that kind of forgiveness. I haven't heard, seen the, that kind of meekness. He or she reminds me of Jesus Christ. I pray that the world will see your holiness and they will see God through you. Amen. Let's pray to our Lord.